You don't, <laughs> Sam, how do you not know his middle name? His middle name, well, actually, I don't know. It's Jay. But I know this because Bob uh, eloquently named a company after himself. His first company was. <laughs> oh, really? What do you think, what do you think the RJ stands for? An R- are we, are, when do we start talking about my humility and my. <laughs> <laughs> this is Top Line. This episode is brought to you by the crippling fear of your typical sales process not working as well as it used to. Uh Uh-oh. Thankfully, it's also brought to you by Ecosystem-Led Growth, a new book by Crossbeam CEO and my good friend, Bob Moore. Learn how your partner ecosystem will serve as your most efficient and scalable source of revenue growth. Sleep better at night and pre-order your copy at elgbook.com. That's elgbook.com. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 45 of Top Line. Uh, We're joined, we've got a very special guest today, my good friend, Philadelphia resident, multiple serial entrepreneur, uh, former stand-up comic, and now author. His name, ladies and gentlemen, is Robert France Gerald Moore. <laughs> oh, have you been talking to my grandma again? <laughs> I was no, thinking of the middle name, so I said France Gerald, which I don't know what that is. You don't, Sam, how do you not know his middle name? His middle name, well, actually, I don't know. It's Jay, but I know this because Bob uh, eloquently named a company after himself. His first company was. Oh, oh really? What do you think, what do you think the RJ stands for? An R- are we, are, when do we start talking about my humility and my- <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we've got Bob Moore, folks, uh, the found, one of the co-founders and CEO of uh, an incredible company called Crossbeam, uh, the leader in ecosystem-led growth. He just wrote a book that came out with uh, through Wiley called Ecosystem-Led Growth. Is there a subtitle to besides EL? Tell us about that book, Bob, before we dive into the episode. Yeah, it's called Ecosystem-Led Growth. The subtitle is Ecosystem-Led Growth. And if you go to, <laughs> to ecosystemledgrowth.com, you can learn all about it. Um, no, the, it's um, um, the playbooks for uh, using your partner ecosystem to drive sales and marketing success. So, um, you know, we can get into uh, all the details around how that comes to be. But um, it's kind of just a culmination of uh, experiences, stories of great companies that have been able to do this successfully and kind of uh, observations of the market and the macro environment and kind of the, the why now question around this catching a lot of momentum uh, inside of a lot of a lot of great companies right now. This whole movement around um, just basically, you know, making ecosystems your your primary channel for growing your business. I love it. Well, we're excited to have you. Asad is uh, is effectively our host and guides the conversation. And so, at this point, I will be signing <laughs> off. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Goodbye. Um, okay, so let's jump in, guys. Um, we have. A lot of really interesting things to talk about, Bob. We're going to talk about partnerships, like a thoughtful breakdown of what's happening there. But you're also a great operator, and you've operated in previous downturns, so we don't touch on that. But let's just start with partnerships and the fact that partnerships is having a moment, right? Um, in 2023, we heard outbound was dead, inbounds broken, CS needs to change. Uh, but partnerships had a lot of hype. So can you kind of break down the setup for us? Why was partnerships having this moment in 2023 and still? And what are the things that played into this happening as well as what needs to happen from here on out for us to not hear the things we're hearing about outbound, inbound and CS about partnerships in let's say a few quarters or a few years from now? Yeah, um, so there's a big legitimate why now behind a lot of the time and attention that's been going into ecosystems and, and partnerships specifically in the last few years. Um, the funny thing about partnerships, if you compare it to something like inbound or something like even customer success, partnerships is a term that's been around a lot longer than those, right? Like CS and inbound. These are these are terminology that were kind of invented by a market as part of a category creation motion and um, uh, you know, I think in in direct response to some major structural changes that were going on at the time, partnerships is interesting because it's got a history. So, uh, you know, a, a part of why people's eyebrows go up when you say, hey, partnerships is having its moment is because if you rewind the clock a decade, partnerships was not having its moment, right? Like, mm-hmm. this is why I, lo- I love doing stuff with the pavilion community, because it's it's largely full of not necessarily 
partnership folks, but full of uh, sales professionals, revenue leaders, go-to-market professionals, a diverse mix. And you talk to a lot of them and you say the word partnerships and you get an eye roll, right? And the question mm. is like, why, not just why is partnerships hot right now, but why was partnerships not hot a decade ago? Mm. I don't think we need to go back and deconstruct that. And a lot of it stems from the fact that historically speaking, partnerships has been um, a function that is viewed as interference uh, in a sales reps or sales leader's ability to get done, uh, get a deal done with a minimum amount of friction, minimum amount of additional parties around the table, minimum amount of delays. Um, the, the ability for partnerships as a function to be effective has totally been dependent on human beings inside of the partnerships function, kind of being effective advocates for how and where uh, partner relationships can either source new deals or, you know, hopefully help uh, win competitive deals or influence deals that are in flight. The thing that's changed in the last couple of years is that the the modern API economy and the emergence of the cloud has radically lowered the cost of adding an incremental partnership, right? Like if you can sign up for Zapier, you can connect to SaaS products in a way where the value of they combined is is more than the value of the the sum of their parts, right? Um, and the amount of integrations that exist uh, between individual products and also the way in which uh, folks are able to service those products has just become much, much, much easier. And because of that, there's just been this incredible explosion. It's like, you know, order of N squared explosion in the number of these uh, quote unquote partnerships that exist between companies. Um, and what that is really a reflection of is not just the underlying technology concerns, but you think about how people buy software on the other side of all of this. And you think about it from a buyer perspective, this API explosion has meant that there are new considerations when people are picking up new products and bringing them into their companies. And one of those considerations is what is the interoperability between this and what's already in my stack? Or what do I need to buy at the same time or alongside this thing in order to actually get a fully realized version of the value proposition out of this thing. Um, you know, the, the movement toward hyper-connected, highly data portable, kind of API-enabled businesses um, has kind of created a paradigm shift in the buying pattern, which should be something that has every single person who's selling anything paying attention. So this why now moment kind of comes in this like confluence of things. A, yes, it's kind of the decline of a lot of other channels. B, it's people are buying very, very differently and where a company sits in its ecosystem is potentially as important or more important than the standalone value proposition of the product. Um, uh, and then C, the number of uh, and the point in which a company's journey that it can start to have these integrations, have these partnerships, build out these ecosystems is much, much, much earlier, which means it's relevant to a whole lot more companies. So you add all those things up and you start to get into a place where you know, you can you can look at the typical sales pipeline of a business trying to go to market right now and make some pretty keen observations around how uh, the the way in which an ecosystem is influencing that pipeline, either directly or indirectly, is much, much more of a force multiplier. Um, and we can talk a little bit about like the data layer that that powers a lot of that. But by and large, um, you know, there, there are a lot of these effects, both technologically and from a market standpoint, that are that are driving this all at the same time here. You're, Bob, it's really interesting to talk about the integration piece of this. This is something that I, I uh, talk with your VP of product, Lindsay, about pretty frequently yeah. on integrations. And, and while it has gotten easier, it still feels like a pain uh, to deal with on like it's maintenance, whether you're doing it your own, are you using an iPass, are you, how you're doing it? And then I think the thing that has also challenging with this is that technology is one part and everything's plug and play. Yeah. But then the ecosystem or actually like the thing that needs to happen on the marketing front, on a go-to-market front, on a referral front, on a co-sell front, like that piece is still feels like it's a little bit more of an immature phase, certainly for yeah. startups. The accessibility of those things, the resourcing of those things is a challenge, uh, it feels like. Do you, I mean, do you see that improving over the next several years or is that something that still needs some work? to be to be done. Yeah, it's a great observation. I, I actually think what's fascinating about the last few years and where this is all going is that 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 model, the directionality of that model is kind of getting flipped on its head a little bit. And what I mean by that is the conventional wisdom would be, okay, 
we're going to have our product team build out an integration. We're going to kind of do the heavy lifting of making A connect to B. And then on the heels of that, we'll get to see things like uh, which customers adopt it together. And then how can we price and package against it? And then, hey, can we tell a story about those joint customers and how they're getting joint value and use that to do market development and drive more pipeline? There's this, this kind of linearity where you've got this kind of um, painful J curve that exists where you have upfront investment that happens on the technology side that's kind of a blocker to being able to realize the go-to-market benefits. The cool thing that's been happening is that what we see now because of the the data layer that Crossbeam unlocks is you can actually do the go-to-market stuff before you even have the product thing live, right? So when you talk about all the costs and the complications of doing co-selling, of you know, kind of co-marketing, doing market development with partners, those things are only painful because you you are doing them historically in advance of knowing what the actual ROI is or knowing if they're even going to drive results. Like you probably don't think twice about your partner relationship with like the 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 hub spots of the world, right? Which like undeniably are the gorilla in the room that drive a ton of business. And like, there's kind of this implicit value, like the time spent on that engineering effort or those go-to-market efforts are probably, they seem inexpensive compared to the returns that you get. And part of that is because they're, their magnitude makes them more of a sure bet. What companies can do now with the the non gorilla in the room partners is you can go into an account mapping platform like Crossbeam and you can say, hey, before I even build the integration, let's understand how many customers do we have in common and who are they? Yeah. Let's look at our prospect list and understand, uh, hey, if we were to actually co-promote something, how overlapping is our ideal customer profile actually in reality? Um, you know, what's the what's it actually look like? When you look at our active opportunities, how many people are buying my product and this product at the same time at any given time? And what has that looked like historically? And you can start to actually map out like the surface area of the TAM that that collaboration could unlock or that that collaboration could enhance. And even potentially, we see companies with no technology integration whatsoever doing incredible go-to-market work alongside one another just because their ideal customer profile overlaps and because there's a better together story, even though the da like data point A doesn't talk to data point B, right? Or, or there's some kind of Salesforce as middleware, right? Or like a data warehouse as middleware exists. You don't even have the integration at all, but the story about, hey, the, if you buy A, you want to buy B because they are able to drive toward a unified value story where they make each other stronger. We see that all the time in analytics. We see that in the MarTech stack. We see it in cybersecurity. Um, and we see it in e-commerce a ton, um, companies able to basically get the go-to-market benefits early without making major investments in expanding their partnership team and throwing more humans at the problem without big investments on building a, a, you know, giant technology project to make the integration extremely bespoke. Um, so I, I think it really is your, your point is, is correct, which is nothing comes free and you are going to need to care about these things from a go-to-market standpoint. The cool thing is you can have a real good sense of how well it's going to work before you get super deep in. And that, that was not true five years ago. That's the big the thing. The one, one thing I'll point out, the use case that we just like, I guess, supercharged just last week with Crossbeam, uh, we're evaluating payroll providers and yeah. which payroll providers we're going to integrate into to quota path to pay out commissions. Oh, that's and cool. One, one of them sent out their, uh, their Crossbeam and we have 30% overlap with this big payroll provider. We were then able to take that and triangulate that with HubSpot that's the really cool. interesting yeah. thing, right? Because like, as for us, it's like, we're the middle partner to this of like, well, wait a second, we'll evaluate ours 30%. That's a pretty large overlap. But what does that look like in HubSpot's overlap? Because we have uh, opportunity to like, look at that data and where we have overlaps with their customer base. That's so cool. I'm glad you brought that up. That is such a common thing. We've actually thought about building some interfaces specifically for, we call it like a stack analysis, right? Like, my my last company was called Stitch Data, super nerdy business, like total middleware company. So all we do is like pull data out of SaaS APIs and deposit it into data warehouses, right? And we sit in the middle. It's totally ELG, right? Because we're like, no one buys just our product. You have to have something on either end in order to buy it. So what, when we would sell through an ELG motion at that company, people are always buying a... Uh, a pipeline product like ours, an ETL product, but they also need a data warehouse to put it into. And then they also need a business intelligence platform or analytics platform to put on top of it. And that meant like, we didn't particularly 
Like we got kind of excited when we heard oh somebody uses Snowflake. That's a data warehouse. It's a partner of ours. When we got real excited was when we knew that somebody had Snowflake and they had Looker sitting on top of it, but they didn't have a stitch yet. Um, and even more excited if they had like, you know, a, a reverse ETL platform on the other side, or they had some other thing that had operationalized it. Because it meant that once they brought in Stitch, there was just this like domino effect of multiple products where the value proposition of that product would get supercharged by the fact that our data was flowing into it. And it just made for like, you could look at the statistical, like what's the close rate on deals where they have none of that stuff? What's the close rate when they have one piece of that stack filled? What's the close rate when they have two pieces of that stack filled? And it was like clockwork, like an exponential curve. Like we got into a situation where, you know, say there's five pieces of technology in like your ideal modern data stack and they have four of them. Um, it was almost 100% guarantee that, that, that it was a close. And if they were our partners, we'd edge out competitors because the strengths of the partnership allowed us to like leverage the partner stories, the joint case studies, the way in which there's social proof that this stuff all works together really well. And that's like, that, that's like a pure play ELG play, like back in, you know, 2018, before we were even talking about this stuff. Bob, when you say partnerships, it could mean so many different things. So maybe like, maybe we just define based on what you've seen play out over the last year or so, as well as just how the ability to structure partnerships has evolved because of APIs in the last four, five, six years. What are the different forms of partnerships where you think there's legitimate opportunity today? Which ones are not, you know, hot? As well as who should be thinking about this? Because sure, like some Series A companies, I would love for HubSpot to like, partner with me and this makes a lot of sense but then how, that company doesn't get hubspot's attention when is it time to think about it when is it time to not think about it can you just frame it a little bit for us in the audience yeah it, it's a good question and it goes it, a lot of that goes back to the fact that partnerships has kind of existed as a generic term for so long that it, it becomes very overloaded and there are a lot of these this alphabet soup of different acronyms that exist in in the partnerships world um there's some good stuff in the book about this. So I, I'll summarize to say that there's um, there's kind of these two mega categories that exist within partnerships. And, you know, people can parse out and try to add more. But um, generally speaking, the ones that matter in the context of this conversation are technology partnerships and go-to-market partnerships or channel partnerships. The channel has been around forever. Um my brother uh, uh, sells um, forklifts for a large like forklift uh, manufacturer. Uh, and, you know, that company has been around for decades and decades. And they're part of like a, uh, a manufacturer, distributor, uh, dealership model, right, that exists in that industry. That's channel sales, right? It's like there's, mm -hmm. there is a, there's another party involved that is directly in the line of bringing your product to market and, and fully allowing that value to be realized. So when you talk about channel partnerships, this is your classic, like the, when people talk about the channel, right? This is it. It's got system integrators, which can include global or regional system integrators. It's got managed service providers. It's got resellers. Very often people consider affiliate programs to be bucketed and sign of the channel. The important thing there is that they are using services typically that are in the form of either uh, consulting, implementation services, or just sales uh, by, by virtue of being a reseller as a way to bring your product to market. Um, channel sales, super common for people going international. Um, you know, it, it, uh, uh, companies like Microsoft have just these incredible, absolutely enormous global channel sales programs. It's like how the vast majority of um, you know, their products get brought into emerging markets, um, as well as getting sold in, in established markets as well. So that's the channel. It's always been there. Technology partnerships are ones um, which you could argue have always existed also, um, but have really, really exploded for the reasons I stated earlier and more recently, which is where you have a, a, a vendor and another vendor working together. And sometimes you hear this other acronym, uh, ISV or independent software vendor, which is like basically a tech partner. If you've got two ISVs working with each other, then what it means is that you've built some kind of collaboration or integration between these two products. Uh, and again, one plus one equals three uh, for whatever reason. So whether it is, uh, you know, the uh, quota path widget that gets embedded inside of uh, inside of HubSpot or whether it is, um, 
you know, an Intel chip getting embedded inside of a Dell PC, um, you've got this thing where uh, these things combine to create something greater than the sum of their parts. Um, it's gone from something as hard as, oh, can you manufacture uh, PCs and uh, print silicon uh, to something where it's like, oh, can you set up a really lightweight integration? And that, that's a big part of why tech partnerships have gotten so big. The conventional wisdom is like the channel lives inside of the sales organization and technology partnerships live inside of the product organization. The thing that's changing is that people are realizing these technology partnerships are also an incredible source of go-to-market leverage. Um, for a lot of the reasons that I stated before. Um, and when we talk about ecosystem-led growth strategies, it works in the channel. The, the, the ability to see and understand and collaborate around uh, CRM data between two parties, one of which might be a channel partner, um, has a ton of use cases and is really interesting. But I'll be honest with you, there's almost 20,000 companies on Crossbeam right now. At the time that we had our first 10,000 on there, 9,500 or more were people dealing with technology partnerships. Like the the bleeding edge early adopter big winners in the ELG movement have been folks that have had these really successful technology integrations and popped their heads up and said, oh, wait a minute, this is actually really materially influential to the way that we grow and to the way that we sell. And that there's a, there's a set of go-to-market playbooks we can apply over top of this data that's going to allow us to actually use it as leverage to, to, to build our business more sustainably, more efficiently. Um, and that, that, that's really the big change there. So you talk about like who should be paying attention to what. I think people that have um, legacy channel programs, I think people that have uh, you know, technology partner programs or ecosystems that have been around for a while, it's applicable. It is, it is crossing or has crossed the chasm into mattering and being able to be applied in those contexts. But for modern companies where the partner ecosystem is in the DNA of the company. Like I talked about my company Stitch before, right? Like it's in the, that was a 100% ecosystem company. Like the very nature of the fact that that business existed was to connect the dots between other businesses. Or if even, uh, you know, basically any SaaS company that exists in uh, Salesforce's App Exchange or Shopify's App Store or, um, you know, has integrations into major center of gravity tech products, um, these are companies where your ecosystem DNA allows you to participate in this stuff way, way, way earlier in your company's life cycle than you would have ordinarily or historically been able to prior to, uh, you know, the API economy kind of reaching the, the point that it has. So, so that's super yeah. interesting. So in a way, what you are enabling is rep and rep collaboration, right? Yes. Yeah. In, in a simplified way, would that explain it? Like I, I'm a sales rep here. Um, at Sales Talent Agency, I've got a partnership with these two beautiful men over here. I go in, I look at their CRM. Which, which like, partnership's better? <laughs> which of the partnerships do you think are doing I love you more? Equally. And so I go and I look, I'm like, oh, Sam's talking to this company that I'm also talking to, or, I, or Sam works with this company that I want to talk to. Sam, help me, right? And I can do the same thing with AJ. So that, in a simplified way, does the technology enable that? Absolutely. Um, so that's a that is like your classic co-selling use case. It's like right down the middle. It's like imagine the complexity. Say you have a hundred sales reps and Sam has a hundred sales reps, and there is some mechanism in theory for your reps working together on these deals. But in a world prior to Crossbeam, um, being able to say, "Oh wow, I just figured out I'm going to work with uh, Sam," you know, my rep. Uh, Bob is going to work with Sam's rep, Tim, on a, on a deal. Uh, they're about to get on the phone together. How do we find out what other deals they could be working on together? Because they both have a book of 500 accounts. Like, so this is like physically impossible, right? Like, but the matrix of like rep to rep and like the yeah. density map of where are these rep to rep collaborations, like highest leverage, um, that's like right out of the box. Um, super easy to do. Yeah. That's super interesting. In my brain, this challenge comes up that is obviously wrong, and you can help me understand why I'm wrong. But the, it, this is what I'm thinking. If you look at sales engagement tech that yeah. came out, right, that said oxymoron things like personalization at scale, what happened? Salespeople and sales managers who had low tenure and high pressure and all these things just abused these technologies, right? They sprayed and they prayed. And they said, oh, it's way easier to convert 10 leads from 10,000 messages than from 100 messages. 
And so we're going to do this. And so in a given week, even right now, I get 50 to 100 emails that have been, you can tell who the sales trainer is, what the technology is. I looked at the format. I don't even read it. I hit delete. I'm out, right? This, this and, is how Asad spends his Sunday afternoons. He's <laughs> diving deep into also these. reading 10Ks and 10Qs. Yeah. Listen to the email I got inviting me on this podcast, suspiciously. Yeah. Like that. that was written by uh, Claude. <laughs> 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 okay, so salespeople and sales managers got this tool that might have been built with the best of intentions, right? But they, it was abused. It was abused badly. And the more pressure there was in the economy and in their companies, the worse they used it. Yeah. What, so in my mind, I'm afraid that uh, sales reps will just use this to kind of spray and pray within our partners and just like do things that lack the elegance, finesse, um, yeah, the elegance and finesse that you would want partnerships to be dealt with, which is why partnerships folks are like, don't give it to the reps, let us do it. Why am I wrong? Yeah, so uh, you're not wrong. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the interesting thing about outbound, sending partnerships aside for a second, and just your example of outbound, is that it is by definition a, a negative sum game. Like, the the more people do it and the more prevalent it becomes the more like the tragedy of the commons sets in which is that uh people's inboxes theoretically have infinite capacity but people's mm. attention span has finite capacity so as you increase the amount of garbage that gets into people's inboxes your share of the garbage you can make it go up by sending more but the incremental attention span that can be applied to one new piece of garbage is actually going down. And the zero sum nature of it is that you get into this like death spiral of just being completely saturated with um, outreach that is effectively non-differentiated and therefore non-value delivered. Um, but isn't that and, because everybody is doing this garbage-based approach? Yes. Like, it's, so we had Tomas Tungus on the podcast recently, and he said something fascinating. He's like, he's got this new firm called Theory Ventures, and he's trying to get founders to talk to him and take a lot of money because they have this like thesis-based, concentration-driven approach. Yeah. And so he's like, I spent three days listening to and reading and watching everything Bob has done because I want Bob's attention. I want Bob to take my money. And so I literally, I stalk Bob for three days and I write the longest, most eloquent email and I get nine out of 10 uh, responses to that, right? So there is this opportunity for elegant outbound. It's just that everybody does this like horrible three lines with a halt, like, you know, that standard, we know who's training it and which technology is enabling. Everybody does that. And for that, there is this race to the bottom, but that creates an opening for elegant outbound, no? Uh, absolutely. So, and, and this is um, your, your uh, scene around corners on, on kind of what I'm getting to here, right? Which is that there's a, the, the spray and pray methodology is extremely tempting and the incentive systems are kind of messed up for reps that have access to that kind of technology. Yeah. The thing that happens, um, whether it's taking an ABM approach uh, or whether it's doing something that's like much more specialized and more researched, is again, uh, um, you will get better results by being better researched and more specifically targeted and spending more time per person. But there's still one catch there, which is if the ability for you doing great research to turn someone who was not in a buying process into a buyer is still very, very low. And like, I learned this lesson at RJ Metrics, my first company, we hired an, an army of SDRs. We did the classic, like Aaron Ross, predictable revenue playbook. And there was a period of time where we had extremely high product market fit. And our SDR team was so incredibly performant and so incredibly ROI positive. And they exercised a lot of like, frankly, kind of probably mediocre processes and, uh, you know, research in, in sending their outbound. But what was really happening on the other side is that there was a really high underlying level of intent among the people that they were reaching out to, to already be buying or curious about our product mm. in the first place. And what the, the function of the SDR group, while in theory, everybody thinks about it like SDR's demand generation, as though they are taking the absence of any interest or intent or demand and translating it into, oh, there's customer education and there's customer activation. In the vast majority of SDR teams, uh, that's actually not what's happening. What's happening is that they are 
basically serving as a persistent drip so that in the moment of yeah. opportunity, in the moment of intent, the, the day after that board meeting happens where this subject got brought up or the day that, you know, whatever else is going on internally where things are getting shaken up and this is relevant, the right email happens to land in the right inbox at the right time. And if you hire enough SDRs, you can, by law of large numbers, be very successful at that. But the catch is that stuff has to be happening. Like the underlying intent has to exist. The board meeting has to have happened. The strategic shift has to have gone on. And what we found at RJ Metrics was we actually hire better and better SDRs and train them better and have them do better work. But we slipped out of product market fit in that business. And the SDR uh, program went completely upside down from an ROI perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and so then the question becomes like, the best version of outbound or the best version of demand gen is not necessarily the one where you have a entry level person magically yeah. changing the strategic priorities of like a you know VP or C level exec at a company and compelling them to care about a product. The question is how can we make sure that we are catching the maximum number of people who may have a level of interest with the right message at the right precise time um, and this is where you get into all the technologies that are out there around intent, right? Uh, and there's plenty of companies in that category, and they're kind of in, in the business of trying to capture and generate that. But a lot of it is from these third-party sources, right? Like they happen to land on a review page, or they happen to do this particular thing that was observable. And through third-party data getting sold to a second party that gets brought to you through somebody that you pay a lot of money to, you get this hint that, hey, these people might care particularly much right now. Where Crossbeam allows you to break that paradigm or like multiply it by 10x is that you cut out the third party nature of that intent signal and it becomes second party in nature. Like imagine a world where you have a little window inside your Salesforce instance and you can peek through that window and you can know everything that all of your partners know at any given time about that particular account. Just because the window's there doesn't mean it's actually a good reason to spray and pray or send the email. Like That's not the playbook. The playbook is know which ones are movers and shakers. Know which ones are buying in your ecosystem, considering deals, working on something, uh, or having recently purchased something that's relevant and uh, uh, kind of connected to the way that you sell your product or deliver your value. And then you have an incredible story and inroads to them from a messaging standpoint to make sure that you get at them at the right time. That's super powerful, right? Like that's definitely powerful. Let's play this example out. Sales talent agency falls out of product market fit because everybody got really good at hiring salespeople and there's so many of them out there that we are Also poor leadership from the CEO. Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Disastrous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that a performance yeah. review was just thrown in there. Yeah, no. <laughs> make I'm the sorry. Land. Land. I'm sorry. <laughs> you too, Sam. You too. Um, okay. So <laughs> for all of these reasons, sales time agency falls out of product market fit. And now there's this anxiety and this fear that drives bad habits, right? So we're getting to like this idea of who governs this. Like, how do you do this in a way that is still stylish, elegant, has finesse involved in it? Because sales managers will feel the pressure of falling out of product market fit and they'll yeah. just start doing frantic oh, crazy stuff. Work. Yeah, yeah, it spirals. Right. Um, it spirals. So who yeah. owns this? Who sits on How do we maintain the finesse in this? Yeah, so and this is... Um, uh, the way I should have answered your question directly 20 minutes ago, uh, because there is a way to kind of get right at right at the answer there, which is um, maybe the most important thing that can exist within the realm of these ELG playbooks and also the strat the the uh, the crossing product itself is the incredible amount of precise control that people have over who can see what, when, and under what circumstances. Mm. So this happens at multiple layers. At the partnership layer, this is not like a co-op where a ton of companies just throw all their data in and then it gets stirred up in a pot and everybody gets the pot back, right? This is not that. This is also not a marketplace where you get matched up with random companies and kind of like horse trade data and decide, hey, you got names, I got names, let's go make something happen. <laughs> like you, you see, if you look at traditional like data brokerage type businesses or, you know, hey, let's go buy a bunch of lead list type businesses, that's what's going on, right? This is not that. The nature of this- but, Which by the way, Bob, yeah. I. I, you brought up something that um, I remember being, it was like quoted in the Philadelphia Inquirer when you first started Crossbeam, which Did I thought was you say Tinder hilarious. for business, so I'm going to be real. Uh... <laughs> so <laughs> Tinder for business was one of those, but you also said, if you show me 
mine, I'll show you yours. In terms of like, I don't know mm. it was underwear or what undergarments you're referring to in that quote, but I would love mm. to hear wanna... where that quote came from. <laughs> uh, that sounds incredibly problematic. And I'm just going to say it was a deep fake. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it was AI. It was AI. AI. I have no idea what, uh, what you're referencing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds extremely problematic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can, carry on with your analogy, oh, please. But yeah, it, so look, I'll 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 parlay uh, that beautiful sidebar. Thanks, AJ. The, like the um, that a little bit of this dynamic, right? If it's not a marketplace and it's not a co-op, then what is it? Well, it's almost more like LinkedIn for data, right? Which which does get into a little bit of the like, you show me mine, I'll show you yours effect. Which is um, here's the beautiful thing about that problematic statement: everyone maintains their own agency and sense of free will over what they choose to show others or don't. And in the universe of connecting on Crossbeam, that remains true as well. So when you connect with a partner, even though it's this one-to-one and you both opted in, if the dynamic or the configuration of the partnership is such that uh, they are comfortable showing you the names of the reps that own accounts, but you are not comfortable showing that to them, that's fine. You can set this up so that it's not perfectly symmetric and there's not mm. guaranteed reciprocity in both directions. You can even set it up so that if you don't want to share any of the identities of companies or the identities of people, you can just show aggregated statistics, right? You can say, okay, look, in this particular sub-segment, we've got, in this particular vertical, you know, we've got $8 million of open opportunities, or we've got 34 customers in common and 72 active open opportunities in common. Um, and you can use that as a opportunity to crawl, walk, run your way into a very, very trust-driven dynamic, uh, whereby your partnership expands based on mutual success that's happening through A, identifying that it's going to be worth it to do this in the first place, and then B, putting guardrails in place around what are the real rules of engagement on what we're doing here with these partners? Again, because it's not a marketplace and these aren't random companies. There and also a- Sam could like, in this example of us falling out of product market fit, Sam's my friend. He could be like, this guy is dropping the ball. The company is out of product market fit. I'm going to stop showing them data, right? Like oh, Sam yeah. as the person on the other side can also decide that, hey, I think out of my partnership group, here's some that like, we need to get out of this. Like yeah. we need to own that as well. Yeah, totally. I mean, the 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 owner of the data is the controller of the data, right? So in, in the event that there's a bad actor or a bad act or whatever else, you pull the plug uh, or you dial down the level of access or you change uh, those dynamics. So that, that, that's the partner to partner dynamic. Inside of the company, there's incredible controls as well, right? And that's where you have this really powerful governance around you have administrators who have right, the right powers to decide who you're connecting with and what those data sharing rules are. But then you can have a, a role at the sales manager level. It's possible that your reps don't actually get to see anything except potentially like, hey, there is a there is an opportunity here for you to run an ELG playbook because um, these three partners have some kind of relevant relationship with this company. Maybe that's all the rep gets. Uh, yeah. And you can you can configure it so that the widget the rep sees shows less than what your company at large and your leadership and the people in those more accountable positions are able to access. And then that can trigger a, hey, I want to take an action here that sends uh, some kind of alert to the manager or sends some kind of alert to the, um, the partnership team uh, to potentially unlock more information or enable that playbook. But the reality is... Um, the cool thing about this being so driven by overlaps is that your partners are not going to be reaching out to people that they don't already have some kind of relationship with by virtue of the fact that it's in the center of the Venn diagram. So it's not like a spray and pray, I'm going to get your marketing list and just email everybody and they've never heard of me. The The whole nature of the play or the, the customization of the messaging is because there is already some story to tell about why mm. these things are relevant together, or why there might be a uh, a plus B story to be told. Um, and you know, the, the dynamic that we've seen now again with like close to 20,000 companies, it's like, I can count on one hand, the number of times that there's been a like, Hey, what the heck did you send that email? All right. And, and those things would get back to it, right. That would be like the, you know, that'd be in every G2 review about Crossbeam, right. If there was like the, the risk, that's a really interesting thing. Data that's so like, cool. If that's, yeah, if that's a risk, where is it, right? Like, it, yeah. it's a smart question to ask, and it's a good one to understand. But the practical reality on the field is that um, because of the nature of these 
uh, these relationship dynamics and these rules of engagement and the controls that people have over what happens to the data, it just doesn't happen. In, in I love that. I love that. Hey, CMOs and marketing VPs, that's Chief Marketing Officers, join Pavilion in New York City, the Big Apple, for the CMO Summit on April 18th. The CMO Summit. At CMO Summit, you'll connect with other amazing B2B marketing executives and learn from folks like Udi Lettergor from Gong, Latney Conant of Sixth Sense, Andrew Kale of Help Scout on topics like mastering the customer lifecycle, AI and marketing, and building an iconic brand. Register now at joinpavilion.com forward slash CMO Summit and use the code TOPLINE for an exclusive 15% discount on your ticket. That's joinpavilion.com forward slash CMO Summit and the code TOPLINE for an exclusive 15% discount discount on your ticket. I will be there and I look forward to seeing you there. It's going to be fantastic. Sam, you've spoken very interestingly about partnerships in a bunch of our previous episodes. And I'll, I'll paraphrase Sam. I can't be as stylish as you, but I'll try to paraphrase, which is that when there was ZERP, there was abundance of capital and everybody's thinking was a lot broader. My, I'm, if I was envisioning my business, it was solving way more problems and it was doing many things. And one of the interesting things that happened is as interest rates went down, the constraints forced the narrowing of the aperture where you're like, this is my core business that I'm going to focus on. And it created the opportunity for you to partner with people that in the past might have been competitive or future competitors, right? And you've really enjoyed these collaborations. Is there a fair in your, and this has been the, 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 the experience for so many of us, right? Do you think there's a fair in the market or we should be afraid of the fact that as interest rates come down and capital becomes more available, that our apertures will widen and the opportunity for these really interesting collaborations will reduce? Or have we all learned some lessons and we'll maintain them? What are your thoughts? My thoughts, I think there's impetus for partnering with similar sized companies mm -hmm. or companies the, the, the tricky thing I was just on a webinar talking about, cause we were talking exactly about the topic that you and Bob were talking about, which is how outreach effectively, you know, took a mid or early career professional, armed them with the most powerful communication tool in human existence. And then, you know, completely destroyed outbound sales in the, in the, in the course of, in the course of their evolution. But the point that we were making is that, you know, outreach and gong used to be partners and now they can't be partners because their roadmaps all lead to the same place. And they're in this sort of middle ground of consolidation where they, Outreach Gong and Clary, have all decided that they're going to be the all-in-one kind of revenue intelligence and enablement solution besides Salesforce that sits next to the CRM. I'll throw Zoom Info in that list with you. Yeah, Zoom Info. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. And then, and you never know if Sixth Sense gets big enough that they decide right. that they need call recording technology. And every, and eventually, like all of these roadmaps lead to the same place, which is, which is a topic, you know, a comment that I've made really about what you think of the relative market cap of some of these companies relative to Salesforce. Because at some point, the implication of all these valuations is that they will replace Salesforce because you can't have, well, I don't think you can have, you probably can't have like five $20 billion companies totaling $100 billion in market cap unless you think that sales, the, the market is 10 times bigger than that or whatever. But that's not the point that you're asking. Also, the point you're asking is, well, how can you confidently compete uh, a partner if, if you're worried that these companies are going to compete? And I, that's why I think like two different point solutions probably have a really good opportunity to partner together mm -hmm. as long as you have confidence that, that you're not going to compete. And that's where you have to have a really open and honest conversation with the partners on occasion. It just depends how closely adjacent your roadmaps are and your overall company progression is. And, you know, for us, we're not a technology company. So the companies that we partner with are consulting and services companies. But I literally had this exact same conversation with Sangram at GTM Partners this week because he does conferences. I do conferences. He does some level of community. I do some level of community, but we want to work more closely together. So he said, here's the things I'm going to do. I said, here's the things that I'm going to do. These are the areas where we're not going to compete. And there's the areas where maybe we can find some collaboration or synergy. And I think that kind of conversation is possible. The, the, 
It's also possible on the other end of the spectrum, right? It's also possible with HubSpot and Quotapath, right? Because HubSpot is so much larger than Quotapath at this point that AJ is not worried that like his roadmap will end up becoming, uh, you know, a CRM and Look, marketing if, automation if platform. HubSpot wants to go build a sales commission <laughs> platform, <laughs> God bless them. <laughs> uh, this, this is 100% also, I, I agree with everything Sam's saying, where you, you we're not going to part, I don't think we, Quotapath, will partner with a gong uh, clarity and outreach or because it's just like it i look at the first off i think maybe hot take i think they're all wrong i think they're wrong in that revenue intelligence i don't think what they're building in the conversational world is actually what revenue intelligence uh means and what really cro's rev ops leaders and finance leaders are looking to build they all look at those as cost centers i was at uh an insight um conference with seven CROs around the table, six are ripping out Gong next year. Wow. Six. Wow. Yeah. That's because a it's huge data it's a commodity. Point. Commodity. Wow. It's a commodity. So I have a totally different point of view that I'm sh not sharing, ready to share with the world yet. No, it's really interesting, by the way, that you say that because because Guy Rubin, Ebsta in many ways is like the the SMB, I don't, yeah. I love you guy, but the cheap version of all of these platforms, <laughs> no, but it's exactly what you said. He's like, we just wrote out AI enabled call recording and transcription and integration with the CRM. He's like, because it's commodity, it's like super easy. We're just not going to charge 200 yeah. bucks a month per user per seat or whatever. There's so yeah. many, um, it's company fathom. I keep seeing everywhere. Yeah, fathom. Um, That's the like, one. you know, YC company, they haven't raised, which by the way, I money. talked to that founder, like three months out of YC, three months. Yeah. And had this ridiculous market cap for his his business. I was like, "Good luck, dude." I mean, there, I see him all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> yes. This is Bob. This is what we do. We just call out other founders. We make friends. <laughs> we make new friends. <laughs> the community loves us. Listen, all if you go listen to the other forty episodes of this, your name's probably mentioned a few times. It's uh... it, actually though. This is so interesting because we we flip from talking about partnerships to sales. And that's an area, Bob, I know that you're doing a lot of exploration on and how partnerships and sales, like yeah. who's the buyer in this world? What actually works and resonates to market? Like what is your your take on this right now? Yeah, it's, um, uh, it's funny too, because the last Pavilion webinar I did, um, I think Sam and I were on together and we got into this conversation and the audience was like half salespeople and half partnerships people. And like, it got pretty spicy. Uh, pretty I watched it last night, yeah. Yeah, um, th there's a... There's an element here, right, where um, I uh, I think there's a incredibly important and valuable contribution that the partnership teams make into this entire you know ELG movement that we're talking about. But ultimately, uh, the end game of this, not because we believe it to be true, but because we have observed it over and over and over again at the absolute best customers that have implemented this stuff the best. The end game is actually when this is something that is directly creating leverage for sales professionals. Uh, like it's being not necessarily brought in exclusively by partner teams and then kind of like managed and facilitated and delivered into sales orgs by a kind of partner team in the middle. But in fact, the partner team owns and kind of handles the ops side of connectivity to other companies. But then you really have RevOps or a, like a true piece of the revenue enablement team actually deploying this out and ultimately actually procuring it as well and, and being the buyer. And, and the thing that we've seen, you know, in the last couple of years at Crossbeam is this fairly meaningful shift from being exclusively a partnership tech tool selling into partnership people to just like the market pool pulling us in a direction of being somebody that is selling directly into sales um, and that has a lot of uh, champions and executive sponsorship that kind of lives more in the go-to-market side of the house. Now, that's not meant to downplay or discredit like the the partner role at all. But I think it is noteworthy that like you can do this stuff and do it well, and your partnership team might not actually grow. Uh, or it may grow in a um in a nonlinear, and by nonlinear I mean like natural log shape, not not parabola shape, right? <laughs> like a um a, a incrementally slower pace than the actual contribution of value or the demand generation or the benefits to the business. That's desirable, right? Particularly in this efficiency focused market. Um, but it doesn't mean that like 
it's it's just a partnerships play. Like like this is a sales play uh, that gets sold to sales folks. Well, does that mean the CROs are buying Crossbeam? Yes, it does. Um, and the the CROs are increasingly That's so like interesting. The signer on the order form, right? CROs and RevOps. Um, uh, so Bob, just on that to click into that because most companies that are selling into CROs, um, a lot of them have felt that CROs just have no budget anymore right now, right? right. Like they're just being told, rip things out, cut people down. And there's some fundamental things that they're allowed to spend on, but CFOs are not giving CROs a lot of space to sell. And it, you sometimes hear something often enough that you start believing it and it dictates a lot of your behavior. So this is a yeah. really interesting like point of view that might give some energy to people that are selling into CROs, but thinking that they're running uphill with the wind in their face. Have you noticed that people have budget and what's, what type of conversation is working? Like, tell yeah. us a bit about that. I want to contrast your question you just asked to the way you prefaced the question to Sam a couple of minutes ago about what happens if rates start tapering down a little bit and people start uh, popping their heads up a little more <laughs> and and like you know uh, things things kind of shift from the mentality of um, you know the, the post Zerp era. Um, I uh, I think what's interesting is like the the pain cycle in SaaS in particular always lags the market reality by at least 12 months because of annual contracts. So like if everybody on the planet spends a year doing sequential layoffs after layoffs after layoffs, on the last day of the last layoff, uh, a layoff happened that maybe happened a day after an annual contract got signed. And it's only 11 months and 30 days later when you have that next renewal conversation with that account that is a post layoff conversation, right? So as long as the pain is happening over some period of time in kind of the primary macroeconomic driven, like main thruster of bad times and like the SaaS apocalypse, the companies that are selling into those businesses will experience a ripple effect of that pain that amounts to that time period plus 11 months and 30 days. Because um, you're, you're going to have to live through the the pain cycle of that first renewal person close, whatever that terrible event was. So like, it's been rough. Uh, it's been rough in, in SAS because not only are you experiencing like the, um, uh, like the protective proactive, um, almost like pre morning of, uh, budgets and, and flexibility early on in that pain cycle in late 21, early 22, as, as rates start to come up, but you're still feeling it. Uh, a lot of companies are still feeling it right now, not because the market's been bad, the Nasdaq's been ripping. Uh, like earnings reports are are looking like really, really hot in, in most of SaaS right now. Uh, but uh, many companies that are kind of on that cycle, it still kind of feels like a, a grind day to day, right? I'm still, I still talk to CEOs all the time who are like, I think I'm going to quit. Uh, I think I'm like, I'm going to find a home for this company or I want to like hire in a professional CEO to come and do it. And like, that's an everyday conversation because um, it's been hard and it's been, it's, it is, it has felt twice as long as it's been, but it's actually been a pretty long time. So I, I return to like, I say that all to say that like, the experience of it feeling really crappy out there is a lagging indicator of the potential for there to actually be a new normal and a light at the end of the tunnel where there's actually some some uptick. So if you're going to get into a market, like say selling into sales teams, when's the best possible time to get in? It's at the nadir, right? It's like mm. if, the, if the, the sales teams are at their smallest and companies are at their most conservative and they have cut down to the bone, but the market signals are actually starting to tell them Okay, rates are gone. They'll never go, you know, God willing, they'll never go to zero again, because uh, I don't know what would require that to come on. Um, but they'll be they'll stabilize. They're not going to continue increasing this year. And by the way, people are buying software again. Guess what's about to hire happen? Um, a bunch of people are about to hire a bunch of sales reps. And that means the same thing that murdered everybody's seats and compressed all their seats in the last two or three years and made everybody say, Oh, sales tech's a bad market or selling into sales is a bad market. They're all about to look like they were completely wrong. And people are, you know, this is going to flip on its head in, in 12 months because like the, the tide is rising again and it may not rise to where it was at its peak, but the directionality is like, I think we've passed the bottom a little bit. Um, and the other thing going on is people are just rebasing their talent pools, right? Like they had to pay 50% more for a rep that was, that was 50% as good. And why not fire your whole sales team in 2023 and then regrow it back up in 2024 with twice the talent at half the price? Bob, I will um, I will say we are having our best upsell quarter we've ever had in it. the history of the company. Totally and it's it, huh? interesting to see that just happen. And we're like, 
what did we yeah. miss these people get hired last year like what is going on because per user c that's the only way we're really expanding yeah. on our side right now but the thing that i will i don't want to say contrarian to this because we we sold to sales leaders we sold to sales reps yeah. early in our day 2018 2019 and cro's have this just proclivity of like deal there they come before the deal gets closed like after the deal and commissions after the deal it's a little bit tougher but before the deal they're like okay and they were open for business on all mm -hmm. of these tools uh the forecasting with clary and i would say crm are the two that are in their like toolkit yeah what i'm not seeing come back though and i talk to CR cro's frequently is their their interest in like thinking about anything else but their jobs, mainly because the last two years they've been beaten down. And so they're probably a new CRO at a new company. And they're like, look, I just need to get like the things, the day one software up and running, like anything that's new. I don't, you know, I don't know. So I think it's an interesting point of view because I agree with you on that bottom aspect of it. I just don't know, like when push comes to shove, you mentioned RevOps. I think you're gonna end up seeing that RevOps has that more you know, in budgetary administrator uh, mindset and have to like partner on the champion side with the CROs and the, the partnership leaders for, for Crossbeam. Yeah, but I think that's fair. I, I think in a lot of cases, like CRO is almost like a stand in for like the persona of the folks that are in the the sales organization, right? It's under ultimately that sales ops budget rolls up into the, the CRO's budget one way or another. The question of whether or not they're the primary champion and the buyer and the person that's like bringing it in, like you're, you're probably right, right? Like it's more that the, 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 the paradigm shift we're seeing is that they are intellectually engaged and not instinctively resistant to the, the topic in the first place. And I think it's the, you know, to your uh, six out of the people at that dinner are going to be ripping out one tool for another next year. Even with Crossbeam, because of the decline in effectiveness of all these other methodologies, it may not be viewed in all these cases as a new thing or a yes and on top of the existing budget, but as part of an exercise in people rebasing the way that they invest, invest in like whatever playbook they're going to run, whether it's the demand gen side or it's the, you know, expansion strategy side or, or something in between in the funnel. Um, and I think that's, I think that's where a good amount of this is coming from is like, we don't think of ourselves as competing with these other tools that contribute to you know, uh, inbound or outbound or data enrichment or whatever else, but, um, you know, budgets are zero sum. Uh, so, so in some ways we kind of do, right. We compete with you too. Right? Uh, it's like anything going after the persona, it's, uh, those dollars are, are finite. Um, Sam, you know, we were talking about outbound and essentially we, when we talked about outbound and especially outreach and sales loft and zoom info and all these tools and, how they led to a lot of damage and how sales is done. A lot of that was like the convergence of those tools, the predictable revenue model and low interest rates, right? And like all this madness happened. You've been talking about this world of profitable, efficient growth, like some of these lessons we've all learned and hopefully we can hold on to them. Do you think there'll be like a 2.0 version of this uh, predictable revenue model where we don't have children who've just graduated from university handling out the first interaction with a lead or reaching out to people and trying to convince them to talk to us, but we actually have people with more business acumen who are more capable of finding the angle and speaking eloquently to get some attention? Will, will we move in that direction? I think we already are moving in that direction. I think Bob said something super interesting. I mean, you, you said many interesting things, Bob, so I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it's just this one thing. <laughs> <laughs> he, said one, he said one interesting thing about 45 minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> and it was, it was in relation to AJ asking him to take his clothes off. Uh, <laughs> But, no, but Bob was saying that the SDR is effectively, we're using the human for what is effectively a marketing drip that it's a marketing drip combined with a, with an easy to access, uh, communications channel, right? Like you send Gmail to Gmail that the, the, one of the main innovations of outreach was that you sent it, you didn't send it through, uh, like Marketo's email yeah. server, you sent it through your email server. And so it had much higher deliverability. It wasn't really the idea that a human was doing it. It was just that this was a way to have much higher confidence that your message was going to get in front of the person that you were trying to present the message to. I don't think that that requires a human being. I think that 
everything that we just articulated could happen through a robot. I think we will look back on email itself as one of the great boons to productivity and to the growth of economic capitalism in the history of mankind, because all of this GDPR and all this other crap about like who's allowed to call you and put me on the do not call us like email was the one place in the world where you could just send somebody a message and they received it. And now there's a lot of, you know, a lot yeah. of rules around it, but like it was a beautiful thing for capitalism and for economic growth to be able to say like, I'm going to put this yeah. message and I have high, this is the one place I know, even if you send them something in the mail, they probably don't check. Yeah, how many mail. deals got done with Mark Cuban by just sending him an email? Yeah. Is he brought in off and talked <laughs> no, about No, it's amazing. It was, it's an, a beautiful thing. Period. So my point is like, so what's the future? Are SDRs going to come back? Is there some new predictable revenue model? Model. No, I think it's the, the future is where we are right now. The future is smaller teams, well compensated, higher performing with all of the crappy stuff where we're complaining about a mediocre early career professional, all of that replaced by automation and AI. That's what I think the future holds. And I think that's the 2.0 world. I think to the point, like the next version of Crossbeam is like, you know, you're still a seller, but there's fewer of you and you have all of this data and there's coaches that are, you know, AI bots or guides or whatever saying, Hey, I mean, and there's obviously marketing campaigns that Bob could run or probably already does run saying like, you know, Verizon or whatever XYZ company, like you share 30% of your customers with this company. You should do a partner, learn more about who you overlap with by clicking on here. But my point is that like, I think the 2.0 world is a smaller is Tomas Tungus, right? Is like a smaller group of high performing, very, very smart, very personable sellers and all of the stuff where we're complaining like why does this idiot send me this email that'll happen through automation and artificial intelligence that's my I, opinion i read something super i was going back and forth with Mark Roberge on this um so Gron released uh some data around ai usage within their platform and i saw something that scared the hell out of me which is 464 percent increase in the number of emails written using generative ai through their platform and you're like oh god like they're going to program this on the back end to use those like boring rules of how to structure an email and people are going to press a button and send an email and press a button and send an email so i think we'll have this bifurcation where there'll be these like really bad habits being done and a lot of this will still continue but then the opportunity is in going unconventional so if at our firm, we use this thing called LinkedIn Recruiter. So it's a search platform, but it gives us a lot of in-mails. And in-mails are like a cold message that I can send somebody I'm not connected to. It's super expensive, $3 an in-mail. So you want to be thoughtful about using it. And when we got trained by LinkedIn, they're like short form, like four lines, barely say anything, just say boo, and you'll get a response. And so we're like, okay, if everybody is doing that, and the highest response rate they uh, they caught was 16%. We're like, we'll just roll long form. We'll do the different things. So we'll write a lot of stuff in these in-mails and we'll give tons of information. Let's see where it goes. Our re open rate is 92%. Our response rate is 40 to 70%, depending on the project, by going unconventional. And what AJ was talking about was when I was in university, I reached out to Mark Cuban with an essay. It was an, I'd never send it cold. I didn't know any training. I just sent him a long essay about why he should invest in my startup. And he responded and he read the whole thing. He asked nuanced questions. So I think there is an opportunity to just see what everybody is doing and do the opposite thing. And sometimes that gets a person's attention. With that, I think we are close to shout outs. Sam. Shout outs wins of the week. This is where, Bob, this is where we, we say something nice about somebody, someone, some piece of content, a book we've read. But we pay it forward I love in a it. good humanistic way. Uh, and you get now to that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Bob, you go for you go for Snakes could be dangerous. You go first. <laughs> uh, I will. I tell you what. Uh, this um, I'll spare it. My instinct always goes, uh, send, I want to send some love to my team, all the Crossbeam folks that kick ass. We've got our offsite in Nashville next week, uh, which I am extremely, extremely excited about. Um, and uh, uh, thanks to the Pavilion community for GTM Summit in Nashville last year, which gave us some real inspiration. I think we borrowed. Nashville owes you a check, Sam. Number. Like, yeah. look at this. <laughs> <laughs> like, inside partners went back the next week, did our their offsite. Off our offsite's in Nashville next week. Oh, my next, God. This year, too. Yeah. Sam should be for free next time. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. Big started started a revolution. Um, I'll tell you what, too. I, I, uh, if you're asking for like media or things like that, I just on a flight. I watched the Tetris movie. Um, Ooh, so uh, just like as a business person, 
uh, who also geeks out on video games and international politics and intrigue, like um, just so movies can't keep my attention anymore, but it kind of checked all the boxes for me. I was really, really happy to get through it. And it's, there's it's a lot of Russia, wonky, right? is like, it is? yeah, it's like the, the licensing scheme between the Russian government and this intermediary British company and this random guy who then got the rights and resold them to Nintendo. So it's like this four chain licensing thing. And then Russia decides actually, um, you know, the person who said they own them don't own them. Uh, and they have to like go to Russia to kind of resolve the whole thing. It's all kind of driven by the true story. Um, but, uh, yeah, kind of scratches the business, uh, itch and also, um, yeah, some, uh, some cool spy movie kind of stuff going on too. I love I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep the Russia and media theme going <laughs> <laughs> and shout out yeah. the Putin interview that Tucker Carlson did. Navalny. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, for all mankind. Um, so I got my, uh, nice surgery on my wisdom teeth got removed and I binge watched two seasons of for all mankind yesterday. It's a really good show as like just it's a historical view um i won't spoil the whole thing but the first thing you find out in 10 minutes the first 10 minutes is that russia won the space race against the us and russia and so we uh get to see a look into what that would what the paths would look like if it would, things had changed there's four seasons it's very ambitious um, but for all mankind, have any of you guys watched this? No. no. Is here's my question: Is it in t- is it four seasons and then it got canceled, or is it like there's some? No, no, they just finished the fourth life. season, January twenty third. Oh, it's an and ongoing. Oh, I it's see. Ongoing. It's on Apple TV, right? Apple TV, Rotten Tomatoes, hundred uh, percent every season, pretty much. Ooh. There's like a ninety seven percent season. It's wow, it's pretty good. My team has been saying you, everyone should watch this, and I'm like, ah, eh, whatever. But I finally like started watching it. It's, it's really good. I'll go net since Sam always has the best one, so you can end it. Um, <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Um, mine, I, I like the intersection of business and art, and I think the Acquired podcast is like the perfect thing that is at that intersection. They come up with an episode once every month or two. These are four-hour-long deep dives on legendary companies, companies that in many cases have been around for 100-plus years. And the latest one that came out yesterday um, is on Hermes and which is just this really interesting company because it's a multi-billion dollar organization that creates every product by hand, which means they need to have figured out how to scale production using humans, training them, retaining them, all of that, which is really, really a hard problem to solve. And they, they figured it out and I learned a ton and I think all listeners would enjoy it. So shout out to them and people should go check that out. I love that. Hermes is an incredible company. It is. That's where you should buy me a gift for my birthday from. I'll get you a Birkin, baby. I'll get you a Kelly bag. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I will. I put on Dumb Money last night. That's actually a really good movie and a really enjoyable movie uh, about the GameStop day trading thing. And I just love the cast because I love Paul Dano (gasps) and um, Shailene Woodley's in it. And it's always fun, just like in the big short, to see like, uh, Hollywood actors playing famous hedge fund people that you read about, like Steve Cohen and Gabe Plotkin. So that's one thing I will recommend. I'm also going to uh, give a shout out to the Pavilion Board, uh, Steve Ooh. Wytrecki, Peter, Peter Fallon, Jason Shine. We've come a long way together, and uh, we just had our best board meeting uh, probably like in a year, year and a half. And we've really been through the fire together because we were – having weekly calls over this last summer when things were not going so well for pavilion. And, uh, and the whole time, you know, I've always said, I, I can't say enough good things about elephant. They've been there with us through thick and thin, even when I made uh, some incorrect decisions. So appreciate their support. Um, and you know, uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of, uh, a feeling of to, to Bob's point about 2024, you know, that, um, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not good times are here again, but it's certainly we're out of the woods. The patient is stable and, uh, you know, there's signs of optimism and encouragement for this year and beyond. So it was great. The illustrious and rare board shout out. Given I know. I know. <laughs> I'm shocked, <laughs> but that's great. <laughs> okay. Bob, thanks so much for being our guest. It was great having you. Good seeing you. Yeah, and hopefully we'll fun, see you guys. soon somewhere. Thank you so much. I'll see y'all soon in person. I'm sure. All right. Bye everyone. Bye.
This episode was brought to you by the book Ecosystem Led Growth, a new book by Crossbeam CEO Bob Moore. Pre order your copy at elgbook.com. That's elgbook.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of Top Line. To learn more about the trends, news, and developments impacting the world of B2B SaaS, head to joinpavilion.com, where more than 10,000 of the world's top go-to market leaders go to achieve and unlock their full professional potential.